Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we will continue now where we left off yesterday in the book, the Protestant book, Rome and Civil Liberty, by the great Protestant historian James A. Wiley. Yesterday we talked about the uh, the, uh, synodical actions, the uh, meetings of the bishops that were assigned over dioceses, brand new Roman dioceses spread out over Great Britain, and how they got together and legislated laws that were to govern first Catholics in those dioceses, and then eventually everyone, whether they were Catholic or not, and how that legislation was forwarded to Rome for approval and for uh, passage, and then become law in Great Britain. The establishment of a parallel or shadow government in Great Britain, totally without regard to the legitimate government of Great Britain, the Queen and the Parliament. A hostile takeover of the country, in essence, is what it is. Now, James A. Wiley continues on the subject of these uh, resolutions, these these pieces of legislation passed in Synod. It says, Should we grant that these resolutions passed in Synod and afterwards ratified at Rome are mainly about spiritual matters, it is nevertheless true that they are spiritual in such a way as to imply the control of the body and the disposal of the goods of the Romanists. Okay? So... The Rome might call them, might call their synods uh, the the, uh, the the legislation of spiritual law, but they affect the body. They're not purely spiritual. Their sole aim is to control the bodies of Roman Catholics, and that even the disposal of their goods on their deathbed. Okay, now where do you suppose the goods? of a Roman Catholic would be would would go. What would Rome demand? Well that they at least have the opportunity to bequeath their property to the Pope. And thus little by little, as it was even before the Protestant Reformation, that Rome virtually owned most of the land in England, because Romanists bequeathed their wealth and their properties to the to the papacy. Okay, so these laws passed in Senate go far beyond the spiritual and go into the temporal, and they are diametrically at odds with the current civil government. Now he says, in truth, these synods charge themselves with the regulation of all matters appertaining to their flocks, Roman Catholics, as a social and political community. For instance, they can place certain classes of schools under ban or enjoin certain modes of political action on their followers. In other words, tell them who to vote for. Is that spiritual? No, it's temporal. And it says it is about such matters much more frequently than about matters of faith that these synods legislate. So when we see, hear of a synod, a Roman Catholic synod, gathering together in the United States of America, we can know, even though it is cloaked in a shroud of spirituality and of religion, they are primarily, if not solely, dealing with laws about civil matters. Okay? And he says, and thus, under the modest name of synodical action, a new order of judges and courts is springing up, exercising a species of hybrid rule, partly spiritual and partly temporal, over a large portion of those who ought to be Her Majesty's subjects, but who, in fact, are the subjects of Cardinal Wiseman. And I will simply add, and by indirectly, subjects of the Pope. Okay? 
Every Roman Catholic is a subject of the Roman pontiff. And it is the pontiff's very reason for existence <clears throat> that he add to his realm <clears throat> whenever and however he can so that he becomes the ruler of every subject, man, woman, and child, whether he be Roman Catholic or not. Now that is accomplished through these civil laws that are first passed in synod. They become law. They become a part of the Roman Catholic canon law once the Pope signs them. And then eventually they are ratified in the civil government. That's, you know, that, that's what most people don't realize, that Roman Catholics, while they are regarded as Christians in this country, when they run for political office, many times people vote for them simply because they are Christians or believed to be Christians. That's what gains them votes. That's why they court the Christian crowd. But in reality, they're not Christian. They're papal. They're papists. And their king of kings and lord of lords is a man in Rome. A fallible, sinful, wicked man whose aim from the very foundation of that church is to rule over the earth, lock, stock, and barrel. And so when they occupy their offices in in our civil legislature and a Jesuit priest hands them a piece of legislation for debate and passage on the floor they are bound with a spiritual a spiritual mandate to pass that legislation so as to impose Roman Catholic canon law which has already been adopted in synod to pass that legislation in the civil governing structure of this country to make everyone subject to those laws. <clears throat> I explained this yesterday, but repetition, I find, is necessary because it's easy for people who have never heard these things before to forget or to get confused. But that's how the process works. He says, and thus under the modest name of synodical action, a new order of judges and courts is springing up, exercising a species of hybrid rule, partly spiritual and partly temporal, over a large portion of those who ought to be Her Majesty's subjects, but who in fact are the subjects of Cardinal Wiseman, and I add once again, the Pope. He says thus, this is the wedge being silently introduced which is intended to withstand the authority of the British law and to render into the British nation. Okay? And the very object, the very goal of this uh, dual uh, legislate governing body is to eventually overthrow the civil government. And that there might be just one government, a papal government, and the United States has been under that gradual transformation almost since the founding of this country. We are slowly but surely, and almost completely at this point, become subjects of the Roman pontiff. And that puts us at diametric odds against our own Savior. The one who came to die for us, to give us liberty in him, have now repudiated that liberty and have allowed themselves to become subjects of the man of sin. James A. Wiley sees that eventuality taking place in Great Britain at the time of the writing of this book, if, it, if the Britons don't wake up to it, and we see it also happening in our generation. Now he says, we've already explained the change which passed upon the Roman Catholic Church in Britain at the time of the papal aggression. From the Reformation downwards, that church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, had existed among us as a missionary institute. In 1850, she ceased to be a mission and became a church, 
a church with as complete an organization and as plenary an authority as in Austria or in Spain or even in Italy. Now, all three of those countries are Roman Catholic by law. And that's exactly Rome's aim for Protestant Great Britain, to make it Roman Catholic by law. And the government that will eventually accomplish that had already been established in Great Britain. The bishoprics, the archdioceses, the dioceses that the Pope created in Great Britain. Now he says, a few words will make the nature of the change very plain. Now listen carefully, my listeners, and you'll see that for years on Inquisition Update, we've made these assertions and we've read different books by different authors confirming the same thing. My longtime listeners will recognize what I'm about to read as being repetitious, but it is, it never, it, it, it's never uh, bad to repeat such critical information. This is important. He says, a few words will make the nature of the change very plain and bring out at the same time its bearing on the country. The Pope's division of the globe is exceedingly simple and compendious. In the first place, the whole world is his. For, quote, the earth and the fullness thereof, unquote, has the Father given to the Son, and, quote, the earth and the fullness thereof has the Son given to the Pope his vicar. Okay? You've heard it once, you've heard it a hundred times here. The Pope regards himself the owner of the earth and the fullness thereof. He stands in the place of Christ. That's why his title is the Vicar of Christ. And that literally makes him Antichrist. <clears throat> he says, looking down upon it from the seven hills, from the Pope's lofty throne at the Vatican, he sees that part of the world owes his, he sees that part of the world owes his sway, and that that part disowns it. Okay? So, James A. Wiley is telling us in his artful fashion that the Pope literally sits on a throne in Rome and from his lofty position he can look down upon the world and see which parts of the world belong to him and which parts of the world do not belong to him. Now he says the first he calls Christendom. In other words, that part of the world that the Pope regards as being owned by him is called Christendom. So do you live in a Christian nation? You think you live in a Christian nation. And for all intents and purposes, it looks like a Christian nation until you look at who's the head of it. Then you realize it's an anti-Christian nation. If the man of sin is the owner of Christendom, then they've changed the term, they've, they've changed the definition of what it is to be a Christian. To them, <clears throat> to them, a Christian is a papist. Okay? <clears throat> the Pope looks down from his lofty throne at the world, and he sees one portion of the world belonging to him, which he calls Christendom, and he said the second part of the world, that which does not belong to him, so to speak, he styles as heathendom. Now, at this point in time, what do you think, how do you think the Pope characterizes Great Britain, a Protestant nation? Well, of course, it's not Christendom to the Pope. It's heathendom. Protestantism is heathendom to the Pope because Protestantism rejects the papacy. The office, the man, the church, the law, the rituals, the, the idolatry, the blasphemy, the simony, the sodomy, and every aspect of Roman Catholicism. We reject it as Antichrist, and we reject it as the synagogue of Satan. So certainly the Pope, when he looks at Protestant Great Britain, sees it not as Christianity, but as heathendom. 
Now he says, corresponding to his division of mankind, he has two sets of bishops. Now this is important to understand too. He has territorial bishops for the Christian portion of the world, which should be read the papist portion of the world, <clears throat> where his sway is owned. And he has bishops in part of us for the pagan and infidel portion of the world where his sway is rejected. Now, before I continue, this, this word that James A. Wiley is using, in partibus, is actually uh, a contract or rather an abbreviation of what the title, what the term really is. And it's full. As you look it up on <clears throat> Wikipedia, the full Latin title for what he is speaking of is In Partibus Infidelium. In Partibus Infidelium. Okay? In that word is the word infidel. Okay? So his bishops in England were bishops in Partibus Infidelium. Okay? It's also known today, since uh, Protestants protested of being called infidels, the papacy, the papacy tactfully changed this term to titular bishop. Okay, Titular bishop and in partibus infidelium are the same thing. A Roman Catholic bishop who is appointed in a heathen land where Roman Catholicism is not accepted. Now this would be the title or the, the character of the Roman Catholic bishops in Great Britain before the papal aggression. They were bishops in partibus infidelium, or titular bishops. Now, <clears throat> here's another thing you need to understand. When the Vatican creates a diocese, in a, in a foreign land and appoints a bishop over it and gives him the title Bishop of such and such, say Constantinople, for instance. That is the title and the jurisdiction of that bishop forever. Once Rome proclaims a diocese, appoints a bishop, it has established its jurisdiction. And Rome never gives up jurisdiction where she has once attained it. To do so would be a suggestion that somehow or other the papacy is, well, fallible. It can make a mistake. Well, the papacy will not embrace that possibility being infallible, when the papacy does something, it cannot be undone. Just like when God decrees a certain day to be holy, it cannot be made unholy. All right? We talked about that the other day, too. <clears throat> All right. Now, perhaps, let's say, as did happen in history, that Constantinople was overrun by the Muslims. And the Roman Catholic Church was chased out of existence in that area. What happens to the bishopric? What happens to the diocese? What happens to the title? What happens to the bishop? Well, the bishop is forced to leave in fear of his own life. But the bishopric and the title remain forever. What the Pope creates is eternal. Now... Since the bishop can no longer rule over his diocese, rather than erase the name of that diocese and the title of that bishop over that jurisdiction, the pope does something very magic. He simply takes that, that bishopric, that diocese, and that jurisdiction, and that title, and assigns it to another place so that it never ceases to exist it just moves temporarily now if you remember in the beginning of this book it may have raised your eyebrows a little bit when uh, James A Wiley was talking about these uh, these uh, missionary bishops 
and that they had titles that were very, very strange, like Bishop of Trachonitis or Bishop of Timbuktu. I can't remember the names of them. We could look back in them. It's not necessary. But I, but you remember when I read them, you you instantly had a question of your mind. There's no city in England by that name. Well, that sounds kind of far-fetched. Bishop of Trachonitis in Great Britain? Well, it just happens to be that there was a literal bishop over Trachonitis, and he was overrun by the Muslims and had to move, so they just installed him in Great Britain. And that's why they called themselves by those strange names, Bishop of Trachonitis and Bishop of this city or Bishop of that city, and they reigned over jurisdictions in which the name of that city didn't exist. They were foreign cities. Now, so long as the Roman Catholic Church remains a mission in Great Britain, those titles are appropriate. But once Great Britain becomes a host nation, in other words, the Pope assigns real bishoprics and divides Great Britain into its own dioceses, then they change the name and, and to uh, Bishop of, of Buckingham or whatever, and then they simply hold the previous name in reserve to be appointed back at its original location if and when Christendom ever reconquers the Muslim world. And that's what we're doing today. That's what the United States is doing today. Restoring to the papacy old jurisdictions so that the, 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 the bishop of Trachonitis can literally be reinstalled. Okay, do you see? I hope I've explained this so you can understand. So the one who was called Bishop of Trachonitis in Great Britain now becomes the Bishop of Buckingham, the Bishop of London. And uh, so previously, when England was a mission and the bishop was called the Bishop of Trachonitis, he was a titular bishop, okay? A bishop in partibus infidelium. And when... Great Britain was conquered then and became a quote-unquote Christian nation, according to the papacy, in other words, a papist nation, then it became a, uh, a, re a regular bishopric, a bishopric. Confusing? Rome has lots of ways to confuse the world. Anyway, we'll continue now. <clears throat> He says, corresponding to this division of mankind, he sets two sets of bishops. He has territorial bishops for the Christian portion of the world. Okay, so the bishops that the Pope installed in Great Britain are now called territorial bishops, where, it, where that nation owns the Pope's sway. And he has bishops in partibus infidelium for the pagan and infidel portion of the world where his sway is rejected. Previous to the papal aggression, he sent us bishops in partibus infidelium, which was a clear token that he regarded us as forming no part of the holy land of Catholicism, but that on the contrary, he viewed us as dwelling afar in those gloomy regions where the light of the Vatican has not yet shone and the apostolic foot of territorial bishop has not yet come. And he says, Here our portion had been assigned us with paganism and unbelievers. But now that the, pon the pontiff has sent us bishops with territorial status and titles, it is an equally clear token that he regards us as rescued from our deplorable Protestant state as brought into the light of Catholicism and annexed to the Christian division of the world. What a mouthful. We'll be back right after this. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment. Stay tuned.
You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com worldwide. Freedom is never free. We need your support today at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support this program and keep this vital education coming forth, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors Inquisition Update. And if you'd like to contact me with questions or comments or suggestions, even criticism, Lord, I get plenty of that, uh, you may contact me by email. Sorry for this on my uh, microphone. <clears throat> you may contact me by email. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. Tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s. Now, we're talking about the installation of territorial bishops. 
true bishops of the Roman Catholic Church, governors, court systems, a system of legislation, a shadow government, a parallel government, a replacement government for Great Britain established by the papacy. It, the church went from a mission to a church. Okay? And a church is a government in the Roman Catholic Church. So wherever the church exists, if the bishop reigning over it is not a bishop in part of us, but has been assigned a territory, that is a diocese, and has attained a an official Vatican title with jurisdiction, he becomes a territorial bishop. Now, can anybody in my listening audience tell me who the first territorial bishop of the Roman Catholic Church was in the United States and when it was established? I'll answer that for you. It was Jesuit priest John Carroll was the first territorial bishop assigned to the United States of America. He was made an archbishop, and he was the archbishop of Baltimore. And he was established in 1808, or thereabouts. Now remember, not many years ago, as a matter of fact, in 2008, Antichrist Benedict XVI came to the United States to assemble in synod with his bishops. And guess what they did? Well, not only did they pass laws that would eventually be adopted by our civil government to make us all subject to those laws, as is their very purpose for existence. But they also commemorated the 200th anniversary of the first territorial bishopric of the United States of America, where the shadow government, the parallel government, or rather the replacement government of the United States got its start in Baltimore under John Carroll. In 2008, 200 years after the establishment of John Carroll as the first Archbishop of the United States, Benedict XVI, Antichrist Benedict XVI, came to this country to celebrate the establishment of the territorial government of the United States. And he did it in front of all the cameras. He did it in front of all the press. He did it in front of the Congress. He did it in front of the president. He did it in front of the Supreme Court. And nobody said a word. Nobody tipped anybody off of what they were really doing. And I want you to know what they were doing in 2008. Now, part of the celebration was to hail the Pope as having taken over his kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's what they sang the Pope while he sat beside President Bush on the, on the White House lawn. And guess who was doing the singing? Roman Catholics. And not only that, but worst of all, and this is something the American people had no clue what was going on, they fired this pope a 21 cannon salute. 21 gun salute right there on the White House lawn. Nobody understood what the significance of that was, but you can darn well bet the pope understood it, and so did, po or so did President Bush. And I've described it here to you before on Inquisition Update, but when... When a, an, a, a, a navy forces another navy, a foreign navy, to surrender, they don't just raise white flags when they surrender. Before they s literally surrender, as a token of their surrender, they load all of their ammunition in the cannons and they fire it all harmlessly out to sea, disarming themselves. And not until that is done is the, is the surrender official. When the opposing navy 
has emptied all of its magazines and fired all of its cannons and all of its shot and all of its gunpowder and has effectively disarmed the ship, only then is the surrender obvious. And that's exactly what a 21-gun salute commemorates, the surrender of a Navy. So anytime you see a 21-gun salute, that's what it represents. But it took on significance because they fired it before the Pope, who established the real government of this country in 1808 through John, Bishop John Carroll. Now, it was an inside joke. None of us understood it except for those of us who diligently did our research to find out what significance there may be in those things that were carefully planned to be conducted when the Pope came to this country in 2008. But now you know. It was a literal surrender to the papacy. And it was a result of Vatican Council II, what was decided at Vatican Council II, that the Protestants would surrender and join the Roman Catholic Church in common communion and under the pontifical authority. That's literally what happened. Now, you don't, you don't think for a minute that they would get up on national and international ter uh, television and announce the official surrender of the United States to a new government. Because that would wake too many people up. They, they were equally as careful when they installed this Roman Catholic hierarchy in Britain so as not to wake up the people. But what they did had real effect, not just on Roman Catholics, but the entire country. And it essentially not, rendered null and void the Protestant government, the Queen of England, and the Parliament. Now, they continued to operate to keep the country in peace so as not to incite a civil war, but the takeover was effective. Okay, It was practical. In other words, it was put into practice. And that's exactly what happened in 2008. Britain was overthrown in 1865, and the United States was overthrown in 2008. And it was publicly advertised, never mind that nobody understood it, but it was, pu it was put on the public record on television. He says, but now that the pontiff has sent us bishops with territorial status and titles, it is an equally clear token that he regards us as rescued from our deplorable state, a state that means Protestantism, heathenism, as brought into the clear light of Catholicism as annexed to the Christian division of the world and as sharing equally with other Christian lands, that is, Roman Catholic lands, in the undoubted privileges and yet more undoubted obligations of government by canon law. Government by canon law. Not government by civil law. The civil law is going to take on canon law. The force and effect of canon law. The civil law must parallel the canon law. And where does that put God's holy, immutable, and eternal law? In the trash bin of history. It happened in Great Britain. It happened in the United States. And this isn't Tom Fress's delusion. And if it is, it's James A. Wiley's delusion. No, what the delusion is, the Bible speaks of the delusion, the great delusion that would deceive the whole world. The great delusion is that the Pope is somehow the vicar of Jesus Christ and that he should reign the whole over the whole world in Christ's absence. 
and to make us all, quote unquote, Christians by making us coercively, without our knowledge, submit fully body, soul, and spirit to Roman Catholic canon law, to submit to papal government, and to reject the government of Christ. That's what's happened. As hideous as it may sound, that is what has happened. And our government recognizes the papal authority. And we prove that through the words of a devout Roman Catholic, a knight of Malta, the author of the previous book that we read on this, on this program called The Global Vatican by former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See. In that book, he asserts and boasts that both the civil law and the international laws are governed by the papacy that the papacy controls both domestic and foreign policy for the United States of America. And any time anybody in this country calls this a Christian country, they don't know what they're talking about. They haven't done the research. They don't understand that Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. When somebody calls the United States of America a Christian nation, you can reply to them with confidence in the truth of what you say when you say the United States is an anti-Christ government. It's an anti-Christ nation. It has gotten in bed with the whore of Rome. It has committed spiritual fornication with the man of sin, with the woman that sits on the seven hills. And just as Israel did, when she went a whoring after other gods, God divorced her. And that's exactly what's happening in the United States today. That's why we're losing our jobs. That's why we're losing our security. That's why we're losing. That's why we're losing. We've lost Christ. We've committed the sin of Israel. And God is no respecter of persons. The same punishments that he leveled against Israel for a whoring after other gods, which were no gods at all, is the same suffering he's going to put upon us because God's justice is blind. He is no respecter of persons. If it was good enough for Israel, it's good enough for the United States of America. And he's not going to treat his house any different in the United States than he did in Israel. The woes that we are suffering in this world today is, number one, because we bought the lie called futurism. We exonerated the papacy, then we made league with the papacy it's at Vatican Council II. Now the Vatican has taken over the government, and she's converting this former heathen nation into a Christian nation. And part of our obligation now as being subjects of the Roman pontiff is to restore to him lock, stock, and barrel everything that he lost at the Protestant Reformation and then to conquer the rest of the world for the Pope. People accuse me of being redundant, but I'll keep repeating it until it finally sinks in. And according to some of the emails I've been getting lately, it's beginning to sink in. And I praise the Lord for that, because we cannot repent of our sin until we understand what our sin was, or that we've even sinned against the Lord. And repentance begins with admitting we've made a, a mistake. We've committed a sin. And repenting means not just a change of mind, but a change of action. We've got to put our faith solidly into practice. We have to repudiate Vatican Council II. We have to repudiate ecumenism. We have to repudiate the papacy as the antichrist of the Bible and put Christ back on his rightful throne and begin to obey him and defy the papal government. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, though they were subjects of the king, they truly worship Christ. And when the king made commands to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, we will not bow down to your image. And even if you throw us into the fiery furnace, God can save us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your image. 
And so Nebuchadnezzar, in defiance, heated the flame seven times hotter than the furnace was wont to be heated. And he threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And when he looked in the window, what did he see? One likened unto the Son of God. There were five, or there were four in the furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and one likened unto the Son of God. And so when Nebuchadnezzar commanded that the fire be put out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of that furnace without even the smell of smoke on their clothes. God will save us if we will repent. But we cannot repent until we understand the error that we have committed. That we've gone a-whoring after a false god. And we deserve the same punishment given to Israel unless we repent. If there's time left on God's clock for repentance, we best get to it. <clears throat> now James A. Wiley continues. He says, at Rome then, the aggression is viewed as embracing not merely our souls, but also our bodies. Nay, as extending to the very soil of our country. So when the papal government was established in Great Britain in 1865, it included the people, their souls, their property, and even the land. The papacy says, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. There is nothing held outside the papal jurisdiction or he ceases to be the vicar of Christ. And he's not willing to let it give up that title. He's going to fulfill his office. He's going to fulfill his prophetic role from the Bible. And it's up to us to call him what he is and to oppose him, just like did Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. We're not to eat from the king's table. We're to eat from the right hand of God the Father through the Son. Are we subjects of the Pope or are we subjects of Christ? That's the question. Fear not him who can destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. We're going to see in our day what it was like to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we better have faith we better have the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because the fire is going to be heated seven times more than the furnace is wont to be heated. And if you're faint of heart, and if you're weak of faith, you may not come out of that furnace, much less without even the smell of smoke on your clothes. He says the Pope then has resumed in all its fullness, his supremacy over our country. Already we have tasted its sweets in the partitioning of our land, in the appointing of judges, and in the erection of courts to administer his, the Pope's, temporal and spiritual jurisdiction. Okay? This is Protestant Great Britain speaking through the mouth of James A. Wiley. We've allowed the Antichrist to come in and take over without a fight. Is that not exactly what the United States did at Vatican Council II? He says his government extends de facto over those who own his sway. In other words, Roman Catholics. It extends de jure over every baptized man and woman in England. Okay, that means over Protestants. His jurisdiction includes... Protestants, whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not. He says, in a hundred points will his rule conflict with the queen's. In questions touching, listen carefully, these are the things the Pope goes after once he has established his jurisdiction. It says, in questions touching education, marriage, wills, Mortmain, and a great variety of other matters will the pontifical tribunals come into collision with the British courts, in many cases openly, 
but in a great many more privately and secretly. Okay? So the Vatican is going to take control of education, marriage, wills, mortmain, and a whole host of other temporal matters. Nothing spiritual about it. So who controls our, gov our education system? Post-Vatican Council II? The Vatican. The Vatican establishes through its bishops, through its legislators, through its Roman Catholics in government, the Roman Catholics establish our education system. That's why you find no Protestant books like this one in the libraries. That's why the Bible is never taught and never allowed to even hardly be spoken of in the schools. The education system in this country is completely and entirely anti-Christ. What about marriage? Well, first of all, they licensed us to get married, and none of us should have ever accepted a license from any human being to get married. Marriage is an institution of Christ. It was instituted in the Garden of Eden. It had God's sole sanction, and it needs only God's sole sanction even today. And there's no paper record of it unless there be one in heaven which God himself wrote. Adam and Eve were married. God, Jesus Christ, their maker, was the third party in the contract. Now what happens when we allow the Roman Catholic Church and her government, her shadow government, to issue us a license to get married? What we've literally done in signing a marriage license is to kick Christ out of the marriage and make the Pope the contracting party in the marriage. And this is exactly why the Roman Catholic Church made marriage a sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church. All right, To take control of that which only God has control. No man should ever accept a license to do anything that God has made holy. A license is needed to do that which is illegal. Okay? If what is normally illegal to get married, then you must get a license. If it is immoral to get married, then you must get a license. Is it ever illegal or immoral? To get married? No. A license is not needed. Do you know what a marriage license is? It's literally a spit in the face of Christ, our Creator. The institution of marriage is divine. And the Pope, thinking himself also divine, as the vicar of Christ, now issues licenses through the state and gives us permission or rather an indulgence to get married. It's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. I regret the day ever that I sought a marriage license and I kick the state out of my marriage and I accept Christ as the contracting party. We'll continue our discussion tomorrow on Inquisition Update. I hope you show up to hear it. It's wonderful stuff. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks.